We're here in Springfield, and we're at my shop, Storybook Joinery, where I do traditional Windsor chair making and period furniture. I have been a uh, woodworker for over 30 years, and about in that 2001, I saw Roy Underhill doing a show on traditional Windsor chair making. I thought it'd be kind of fun, and at that point, after I took it, I became obsessed with the hand tool bug. Today I have two students here, from one from Pennsylvania and one from New Jersey, their father and son, and they are learning how to make a Windsor chair with traditional hand tools. You know, I, I came more for the technical stuff. I do do woodworking uh, at home. I've made some furniture. Um, never built a chair. It's on the bucket list, so I thought I'd come out. And uh, who's idea was it? Who discovered uh, Mr. Boland at first and thought this might be a place to go? Carl. That was me. Yeah. Carl's idea? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and how did you come across his uh, workshop? Uh, through the internet. I was actually looking for something else and as the internet goes, you know, it could be a slippery slope taking a million different directions. What I was searching for was actually colonial furniture uh, and came across Charles' site, looked at it and saw, saw that he did some workshops in uh, Windsor chairs which is something I've always wanted to do. Um, Dad had off, I could take off. Um, the fact that this class is two students is really nice. And Lou, when he called you up and said, Dad, would you like to take this uh, course, what was your impression? Oh, I didn't have a choice. <laughs> when, when your kid says something, you do it. You know, you're, you're in for something, and uh, you're all along for the ride, as I said. It used to be the other way around, you know. First thing I'm gonna do is we're going to take this nice piece of green red oak. It's harvested fresh, it's wet. I'm starting with a pro and a mallet or what we call in the 18th century a beetle. The wood that is, is used is veneer grade oak. Because it's veneer grade there's no flaws in it which gives absolutely perfect straight grain. After it's shaped and uh, brought to its, its correct size, we're going to put it in the steam box, generating a live steam. It'll be lit, the wood will be placed in there and left for about an hour. At the end of an hour, we'll take it out and bend it around a form, resulting in two pieces of wood, the back bow and the arm bow. Once they have completely cooled, that will be the shape they will retain in. Today is the first day, so it's a lot of uh, the real drudge work of, of knocking out the, the wooden parts that have to be made and dry. Tomorrow will be all day of carving a winter chair seat and drilling all the holes and getting it ready to be legged up. Uh, probably on Wednesday I'll be doing a demonstration on turning a set of legs for, for them to show how we turn legs uh, that will go into the chair. The rest of the week will be adding the small parts and it gets into the very technical part which is very tedious of aligning all the parts up, drilling all the various holes and, and getting everything set up to go and then on Saturday we'll be finishing up and they'll be leaving here with a chair. He's taking a um, the raw piece of ribbon wood, uh, he's shaping it down to the spindle for the back of the chair and using a draw knife and a spoke shave it will come into this shape here. One of the hardest parts of the tools to learn is the draw knife and the spoke shave. Uh, they have a, what we call a sweet spot and once you find that sweet spot in that tool it'll cut nice long thin or thick ribbons whatever you want. Because of the nice long straight grain that was in this, this chair now has the ability to flex and bend as people sit in it. When you sit in a true Windsor chair you will feel the back of it give a little bit and as you get out you'll feel it relax much like a, a, an expansion bridge. There are 45 holes in a Windsor chair. That includes the legs, the spumps, the spindles, everything. They're all drilled by hand with a bracing bit. There are no nails or screws in this chair. It's all put together with socketed mortise and tenon joints and they're all wedged and glued. These chairs can take a lot of use. These chairs originated in Philadelphia in 1760s and I have actually sat in a chair that was built in 1790 and it was just as tight and just as comfortable as one of mine. Well we're back here on day four of our winter chair class with uh, Lou and uh, Carl. We're going to mount the arm bow to the chair. 
with the spindles coming through, which we'll leave tomorrow, uh, putting the uh, back bow onto the chair. Uh, it's getting closer and closer. I've enjoyed the class quite a bit. Um, this, the stuff that I wanted to learn, I have learned. It's a lot to take in in uh, just a few days. Um, a lot of the mathematics behind uh, chair making is what I wanted to come and learn. Uh, the angles and how to how to get things looking right. Uh, there's a lot of angles in a winter chair um, as opposed to, let's say, a ladder back or something else. And Lou, what's your impressions of uh, your week here learning uh, chair building? It's been a great week. Uh, it certainly isn't something that I'm familiar with. Uh, I, my woodworking skills are limited, so uh, it's been it's been good for me to you know to pick up uh, a lot of the ins and outs of tool handling, particularly, and uh, hey, we had uh, some quality time with my son and uh, a good instructor that makes for a great five days. There's just a lot to take in in five days, and uh, I'm sure second chair gets easier, third chair gets easier, fourth chair gets easier, so uh, yeah, I, I think I'll attempt another one at home.